Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald, is free on Amazon.com. Seeing the future comes at a price. What price would you be willing to pay to save thousands of lives? Mark Taylor knows his actions scream guilty, but he was only trying to stop the horrible terrorist attack. Instead of a thank you, the government labels him an enemy combatant and throws him in the brig with no rights, no trial, and no way to prove his innocence. He learns firsthand that the CIA can do anything they want to him, anything at all. Mark's just a regular guy, a photographer, who finds himself in an extraordinary situation when an antique camera he buys at a dusty Afghanistan bazaar produces photographs of future tragedies, tragedies he's driven to prevent. His frantic warnings about September 11th are ignored, but put him in the government crosshairs when he learns what being labeled an enemy combatant really means. Download this intense and gripping thriller now, free on Amazon. No Good Deed, book one of the Mark Taylor psychological thriller series by M.P. McDonald. As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, book one by Risa Walker and Caleb Ansel. From Risa Walker, the award-winning author of the best-selling Kronos Files, and debut author Caleb Amsel comes a chilling story of altered reality and psychological terror. Chase Ray sits perfectly still, his thumbs traveling across the screen of the broken computer tablet, stuck in the nexus between two worlds. Haddon Wood isn't real. It can't be. Another world, another reality, hovers just beyond his reach. He can see it sometimes. He can almost touch it. In that world, things are in balance. The dead stay dead and the creature feature remains safely on the screen. That world isn't a patchwork quilt of every scary book or movie he's seen. In that world, the nightmares generally end when you open your eyes and people don't glitch in and out of existence. Chase is determined to return to that world, although he's a bit worried that the only way out is through the noose that seems to lurk around every corner. He needs allies to get back home. But how do you choose your team when you can't tell who's real? As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Amsel. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business, and she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love and will help you to up your writing game. Pico's School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted, and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters. More in-depth courses will be added in 2020. Make sure you don't miss a thing. picoshouse.com slash newsletters. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2 are only 99 cents for a limited time. The gods are rightfully imprisoned, and Cess intends to keep them that way. But her terrorist father has other plans. Gregory D. Little's Unwilling Souls is a pulse-pounding chase through an epic fantasy world of adventure, sinister conspiracy, and a magical industrial revolution fueled by harvested human souls. Cess is the daughter of powerful parents who would very much like to kill one another and who therefore pretend she doesn't exist. An apprentice jailer of the gods, Cess spends her days learning to forge the tools needed to maintain the gods' prison. When her terrorist father attacks the prison on her 16th birthday, 
Cess is forced to flee after the secret of her parentage is revealed. Suddenly on the wrong side of the law, Cess realizes the very father who abandoned her may be the only one who can protect her. But some secrets are darker than parentage. On her way to find her father, Cess will uncover truths about her family and herself that will shatter her understanding of the world and risk the return of the gods themselves. Unwilling Souls and its sequel, Ungrateful God, are on sale now for only 99 cents. The third book of the series is coming early next year, so now is the perfect time to get up to speed. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2, only 99 cents for a limited time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Jenny Colgan back on the show with me. Jenny was on the show uh, just about a year ago, uh, a year and a few weeks maybe, and uh, she is back today to talk about her brand new book, Christmas at Rosie Hopkins Sweet Shop, uh, but that and, and so much more. Jenny's got just amazing stuff going on, and it's always fun to catch up, but welcome back to the show, Jenny. Hi, Hank. It's so nice to be here. I'm excited to have you back. Um, last time when we talked, you told me this great story about um, what a bookish kid that you were uh, to the point that you just could not get enough to read. And, uh, you know, going to the library and, and uh, you know, not being able to get out enough books and, you know, basically reading the library dry. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as an adult, um, we don't have as much. Uh, you know, free reading time as we did at some points, you know, as a kid and also as a writer. Um, how how has being a, a writer changed your reading habits? Uh, has it at all? Uh, do you look at reading differently now that you are one of the people putting your name on books? No, actually. No, in fact, the really the lovely thing means that I just have access. And I remember going to my agent's office the first time around and there was someone else there who I didn't even know who's like a big agent. I need all these books here. And I picked up one that I was really interested in. And he said, oh, you can just have it. And I was like, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, just take it. We're very keen for people to read it. And I every time I went after that, I would come out with just armfuls of stuff. And now I'm on NetGalley, you know, for the, which is really for reviewers and bloggers. Um, but if you're an author, they let you on as well. And um, yeah, no, it's it's really, I'm still a kid. I can't believe, after being a, a child that never had enough to read, I still can't believe that people send me stuff and, you know, let me read stuff early. And Oh, yeah, I, I know. I find it very exciting. We get tons of ARC releases and stuff, and it's just, just about every day, uh, you know, we get something delivered and. And and I just go, wow, I mean, people let me do this? How fun is this, you know? It's so, yeah. so fun. It, it is. It really is fun. Of course, you never quite have time for everything that you would want to read. But the, um, and also, I mean, goodness, I know a lot of people don't necessarily read on e-readers these days, but I still love mine. And um, that amazing thing of somebody mentioning a book that they liked, occasionally two people will mention it and you go I wonder what that is and then five seconds later you have it and it's it's like magic I just can't I'm just like oh there it is I'm really suspicious of the folks that that say e-readers are declining um I just I don't believe that I I know too many people that that are like you and me that uh you know one of my favorite things to do is I lie in bed at night and I'll, I'll read a book and then I'll, I'll flip over to the Kindle store and I'll just discover new things I've met so many people just from browsing around the store and downloading, uh, you know, and like you said, you know, immediately having access to it. Um, I, I think that's still a game changer. It is. Fair. I mean, the thing is, I read quite a lot of nonfiction, too. And if you're reading nonfiction, it's difficult. If you want to maps or if you need a character reference, you know, it's hard to flip back and forth in the book. But if you're reading a straightforward novel, I, I think I still think it's wonderful. I, do you know what? I, I no, I think there is, you know, not everybody likes them, and I get that. But I think this, um, I, I've got no time for the snobbery involved when people, are like, oh, I would never read and download, and you're like, really, really, you know, it, it's oh, I love the smell of real books. It's like, mm hmm, okay. Oh, I did something really rude. Oh gosh, I'll tell you, I'm not a rude person, but this is quite rude. I was sitting at dinner next to a woman I did not know, and she kept going, oh, first of all, you know, I never really read your kind of stuff, that kind of thing, and I'm like, oh. oh. Lord. All right, no need, to, no need to mention it. You're a dentist. <laughs> I would say, oh God, a dentist. Um, 
so I'd had a bit of that kind of snobbery and then she, then she got into the kind of oh no you must have a real book and I went no no they probably wouldn't see I said they're really people that read a lot <laughs> which was a very cheeky thing of me to do <laughs> oh but she was being, you know most people you meet and they find out your job and they are delightful and they want to talk about books they've read and you know they just want to talk about how much they love books and like that's great I can do that all day very occasionally you meet someone that's like, oh, we, I'd never read anything like that. And you're like, well, that's just not, you know, if you'd read in any genre, if you read crime or if you read romantic comedy, then, you know, you just, you're just reading. That's just what you're doing. Well, and, and those people are just not happy is what I've discovered, <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes you just can't fix people that aren't happy and you can, oh, you can. I, no, I think she was probably like, oh, I, I certainly told her, her a thing or two, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, fabulous time. oh well I met this author and I told her I just did not like her kind of stuff and I would never read it <laughs> you know I was really quite pleased yeah I, I hope you're happy with yourself that <laughs> you know <laughs> the rest of our mothers raised us to to be nice people but what well, we yeah. understand I, I think sometimes people are, are a little surprised because it's quite an unusual job and they're not quite sure what to do. but most people of course like in life 99% of everyone is delightful Exactly. Exactly. Well, and speaking of delightful, your books, as always, uh, leave me with, um, you know, f when I get to the end of one of your books, I feel like I've been entertained. I feel like um, that the world is not such a dark place. Um, you know, I, I it kind of restores a little bit of hope and humanity to me. And I know that's probably not what you set out to do. But, you know, um, I read a lot of crime fiction also. And it's good to flip over to a Jenny Colgan book uh, every once in a while and just remember that most of us are, are decent human beings. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I do. I have real trouble writing. I love crime, reading crime fiction, but I have real trouble writing baddies myself personally, which in my line isn't quite too bad. But in the other thing I do, which is write for Doctor Who, that is quite difficult because you need a, a big, solid, scary baddie. And I'm rotten at it. Um. But yeah, no, even when I set out to make someone really unpleasant, I still tend to end up with the exception of if uh, in the new in the island novels, there's a there's a, a woman who's kind of Flora's nemesis and I, I can't make her nice. She's just awful. <laughs> but um, everyone else gets a happy ending. So last year we were talking about Christmas on the island and um, what a great book that was. Uh, but this year um, you've got a, a brand new release now and we were talking just before we started recording about all the stuff that you've got coming out. Um, but let, let's talk about the, the immediate release right now and then get into this other good news that you've got. Um, Christmas at Rosie Hopkins Sweet Shop. How How is this book different from the one that you released uh, last year around this time? Uh, well, it's set in, uh, well, it's, it's set in England, uh, in rural Derbyshire. And it's about a girl who uh, was a nurse. She's a nurse and uh, she has to go and help out her grandmother. Um, but it's kind of fun that she's a nurse because she's in such a small community. She's been constantly kind of called upon to do, um, you know, kind of help out in medical and sometimes veterinary emergencies. <laughs> <laughs> That's how small communities work. Uh, and she is in... Um, uh, uh, she's in a she's she's got to kind of work out what to do with her grandmother who's very old, and she's uh, in a kind of relationship with the uh, the the kind of young uh, lord of the manor who was injured um, when he was um, working for the what you I guess would call the peace corps, um, and uh, so he's kind of you know he's a very grumpy kind of character, and um, so it's interesting looking at the different generations. Um, of uh, of of kind of in the community and what's happening in the small town. The 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 setting is is different, uh, but you know the kind of bucolic small town life is. I, I think a lot of us can uh, can connect with that. Uh, there there are lots of small communities in America that um, you know the accents are different, uh, the snowfall may be different, but it, it's pretty much the same kind of interactions between people. Yes, I think so. Places where people know each other and, you know, they have positives and negatives, uh, small communities. Um, uh, but I, I kind of like to focus on, on what a lot of people find in them, which is, you know, having neighbours and, and knowing, you know, who, who you're sharing your life with is actually a very, very nice thing in many circumstances. Not all, but a lot. 
do you like writing stories about these small communities uh, and and the uh, you know where everyone knows each other's business? Does, does it as a writer does that kind of setting? Um, oh yeah. Is that kind of electrically charged for stories? Yeah, I think so. It it really lends itself in small communities when everybody's kind of, you know, and I realize it's terrible. And I grew up in a small community, as I'm sure you guess. And, and of course, I wanted to move London at the first available opportunity. <laughs> I did so, um, you know, because there's times when you can't bear it. And then there's times when it's lovely, but also because those communities uh, you know, it's always how so and so doing, or I heard so and so broke their arm, or you know, there's a lot of that. Um, and I'm I'm now living in a small community again, uh, and it's kind of really nice. You know, we just in our village, somebody's um, house burnt down recently, and everyone just dug out all their old furniture, gave up their garage space, right? You know, and the whole there was nobody in the town I think that didn't sort something out and fundraisers and all the rest of it and that side of things yes I think there's lots in, in uh, you know there's drama in that I think right um tell me about the character of Rosie Hopkins uh how did she come to you um well I worked in our national health service when I, I left university and and um was always really taken with the kind of stoicism of, of nurses and the practicalities of nurses because they deal with, for not very much money, um, you know, the doctors kind of come along and do glamorous operations, but they deal with a lot of just the mopping up, you know, and the difficult times and spending times with patients when they can. Um, and to be a good nurse, it's a certain type of personality and they're kind of very common sense, very practical, not sentimental about anything. And and, and so I, and which is not what I'm like at all. So I just, I, I just liked that. I, I like wanted to write somebody capable, you know, thrown into a new set of circumstances, but, you know, fundamentally trusting that if they work hard, that it will, it will kind of figure itself out and unflappable. She's unflappable. So I wanted to write about someone like that. What is it like writing, um, books that are you know themed for a holiday uh christmas books specifically you know people come to expect certain things from books coming out this time of year is it a challenge uh to come up with a story uh you know that's themed around a holiday um you know is there something innate that makes these kinds of stories different um how do you approach them from a creative standpoint well, some people, I've got two friends, one who uh, would write the Christmas, Doctor Who Christmas special every year, and one who made a couple of Christmas albums. And they both did it in the summer because you need longer to do it. And so they'd be working on it in the summer and going, oh, my goodness, I'm so hot. I'm trying to write about Christmas. Whereas actually, I find that I always write them. I'm writing one now and I'll start it about now and I'll finish it in January when everything is done. That, you know, unless I'm surrounded like Edinburgh, uh, where I am at the moment, has a Christmas market. And I was cycling into town yesterday and cycled past it and you could smell the mulled wine and the sausages and you can hear people on the, you know, on the kind of helter skelter screaming and, and going round and round and all the things you forget about this time of year. You know, I, I find it really helpful to be in it. Um, and it's also very helpful if it's a time of year that you like, which is <laughs> the time of year I absolutely love. So, yeah, I, I have to be in the atmosphere of Christmas. And, you know, it's a big, big deal in the UK, really. I, I've spent uh, a lot of time in America. And you don't really get started till after Thanksgiving because you have a big family holiday. Um, whereas in the, in the UK, you know, you, you have Guy Fawkes, which is the 5th of November, which is bonfire night. And then, bang, you're into Christmas all the way. <laughs> it's a very serious business. So, um yeah, I like to be in in the mood. I love it. I love it. Um, so, does that mean planning a year in advance uh, because you, you know, wanting to be yeah. in the mood to to write? So, as in a practical sense, that yeah. means writing the year before for this year's release. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm writing for next year. Um, how many books do you have out now, Jenny? <laughs> oh well, in there's about thirty. Four, if you count kind of novellas and, and kind of bits and bobs and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, quite, it, it's really hard to get a handle on it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, quite, quite a few. I, there's nothing nicer than when someone's never read me before. And I'll get a message from them going, I never read you before and I picked up whatever it was. And I loved it. And there's, you know, and then there's millions, <laughs> if you like them, there's millions. 
uh, you can just keep going. So that's very exciting. Um, so yeah, and what's happened is different countries have kind of come to them at different times. So um, so it's been, I've had a really lovely year going around and, and talking to in Germany and Norway and Sweden and all sorts of different countries about what we're doing. It's just been good, really good fun. So much fun. Um, one thing that, that happens uh, inevitably, though, when you start, uh, you, you know, when your success grows and grows and grows and your, your uh, you know, visibility in, in other markets grows and grows, um, that, that also demands a lot of your time. Um, how has seeing this level of success changed your daily creativity? Well, it hasn't really. I just get very precious about my time. Um, uh, you know, I'm just very kind of, they go, I only do things I really want to do. Uh, and I only, uh, you know, and quite often this sounds terrible, but if if I get invited to do things and it's really a treat, um, but I'll quite often I want to go to places I haven't necessarily been before, you know, rather than I can't, if I can't say yes to ev everything, then I, I can get to go to kind of cool places. But um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not that much. I'm not, I'm not, I, George R. R. Martin, I think he spent like six years on the road. <laughs> <laughs> That's just what he does. He just tours around and goes and signs things and everybody's really nice to him and he gets to stay in nice hotels, which I have to say, I can think of worse ways to live your life. Of course. Uh, but I'm certainly not at, at that stage. So no, no, it's very manageable and, and always really fun. Do you, um, uh, when you're working on a new project, are are you a planner uh, or are you discovering the stories as you go? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I throw a bunch of characters in to begin with and really see where they go. So I always, you know, the first three chapters, it really doesn't matter. We're trying things out. We're trying, I'm at quite near the beginning of a new story and I just had a look at today and I was like, okay. And then just bring in a whole bunch of other people and get rid of some. And um, So no, I'm not a good Planner, no but i my 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 method really is to get all the words down and then to fix them and put them in the right order you know to have <laughs> enough material yes <laughs> how do you make a sculpture of a tiger you get a piece of rock and you take away everything that doesn't look like a tiger you know and so that's that's kind of that's that's how i i i do it really I, I like to keep writing keep writing keep writing until i've got enough words and then you know we'll fix it in post as they say in the movie business. You, you said that you're very precious with your time. Do you, do you have like a, a regimented schedule that, that I'm going to be in the office at, at this oh, time yeah. every day? Yeah. yeah. What is, what is your, what does your writing day look like? It uh, was well, actually fairly straightforward because once, um, because when I, when the children were small, I used to pay someone obviously to look after them while I was working and I used to pay them by the hour. So I got unbelievably quick and efficient. <laughs> <laughs> And also I'm an ex-journalist, so I type right really, really quickly. So yeah, I get up, uh, walk the dogs. I have a nice personal trainer that comes and me and my friends share her a couple of times a week, which we don't really do a lot of training. We mostly kind of laugh, but I've decided that that counts. Uh, and then I go to a little coffee shop, which I vary on a very strict schedule and I get my 2,500 words done or whatever my count is that day. And then I get to go home. So yeah, it's... um. It's it's it works pretty well. Do you have you found any tricks uh, along the way that that help the story to uh, to continue flowing once you get it started? Or are you just, you know, one of those writers that just gets fascinated by the characters and you're just following along, watching what they do? A lot of it. But I mean, if you get stuck, then just leave whatever you're doing and just find a bit you want to write, you know, a first meeting or a fight or a kiss or a death or whatever it is that you is dramatically interesting to you. Leave the bit you're doing and go to the more interesting bit. And you'll be amazed how often you get back to the bit you were doing and realize you don't need it at all. Um, and then the other thing is anyone can write 500 words in 10 minutes. Anyone uh, so if I'm having a, a tough day getting my word count up, I'm like, fine, do another 500 words, then take it home, do 500 words at home, go and pick the kids up, sit in the car, do 500 words in 10 minutes in the car. Anyone can do that. Um, and so often I find if you parcel it out, then, you know, it just, it makes the whole thing a little easier. Mm -hmm. So those are my, those are my tips. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, 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 anyone can write 500 words is, is brilliant. Um, because yeah, it's it's kind of like the kid 
Um, I, I heard a story one time of a, a kid who had a, a a newspaper delivery route that he he did on his bicycle, and uh, in the summertime there was a big hill and he couldn't he couldn't ride the bike up the hill. Uh, but in the winter, when the sun started setting earlier and earlier, he found that the end of his route was in the dark, and he had a little headlight on the front of his bicycle. And uh, one day he realized he was on the top of the hill because he was only pedaling for that distance that he could see in the headlights. Oh, that's and, good. That's yeah. Don't ever think that you're writing a book. You're writing a thousand words today, or you're writing two thousand words today, and then more, and then more. You can, if you sit there and think, I have to write a hundred thousand words. That's like James. You're not. You're writing whatever your word count is. That's it. That's all you have to do, and then you can have a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, that you also write Doctor Who and and you write some science fiction. Um, do you uh, do you use those things as uh, you know, knowing that when I get finished with this project, I get to go write some Doctor Who, or maybe the other way around? Does that help uh, to keep the uh, the creative sparks flowing? Um, it doesn't well like that I don't have a preference there's no there's really technically no difference in how it feels when you're writing it you're just writing a story so you know that that element of it isn't the case but I you know I like to mix it up I like uh, working with the people I work with in both genres so it's really it's kind of fun for me um really uh, but but it's not a case of oh I really would much rather be a this writer or that writer I think genre without getting pretentious about it is is very much imposed often i think from the outside rather than the inside i i you know i mean right we're just writing stories you know some have got aliens in them some of them got layers and you know that's it's it's ridiculous to think that you can't like one and then the other in fact for an interesting example of this is how many women's fiction writers or commercial women's fiction writers are now writing crime domestic noir you know, I mean, if genre was a thing, then it would be really weird that suddenly all these kind of rom-com writers were now crime writers. But it's not. Story's a thing. Genre yeah. is just yeah. a, a cover choice, really. Right, right. And you're just writing the other side of a relationship sometimes. Uh, you know, it's it's all – we're all telling stories about people and how we interact yeah. with one another. Sometimes they're darker than others, but – That's exactly right, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um. So the the new book Christmas at Rosie Hopkins Sweet Shop is out uh, everywhere um, now, and uh, you you've got a ton of releases coming up. What what's going on with uh, with your catalog and all that you've got uh, well, going it's really, everywhere? It's really fun. My old publisher has brought out a lot of my older uh, my uh, what we would call backlist. Um, so there's. Um, uh, the loveliest chocolate shop in Paris, which I am really proud of. I think is a really lovely little book about a girl who has an accident and ends up in Paris by mistake, effectively. Um, and that's coming out. And so it, it's just nice. Everything's kind of coming out together. And then we're looking forward to next year when we have, oh, this is a nice story. Do you know the very famous song, 500 Miles? Right. Everybody knows that song. And it was written by two boys that live in Fife, which is where I live, uh, or who are from Fife originally. And when I wrote the new book, it's the book that's coming out next year. It's about two people five, separated by 500 miles, one in the Highlands, one in London. And I really wanted to use the song. And it's really hard to get permission to use song lyrics. It's why whenever you read a book with a song in it, it says she hummed. She's, they always hum it. <laughs> Sing it because it's really difficult to get hold of the lyrics and clearance and I wrote I find out who the management was and I wrote to them and they went oh hi Jenny how's Fife and they let me use their music oh so, wow oh so that's that's a really exciting story so I'm very excited for that coming out next year and uh, so yeah just keeping oh, that's busy really that's gonna be so much fun um speaking of that backlist you know it's every time I tell anyone about it, they get the song trapped in their head for like a month. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Thank you for that. That's going to be an earworm for everybody. We might as well just go ahead and put a a, a YouTube link to the song in the show notes. So, um, you know, I, I think a, a lot of things that people, uh, uh, something that a lot of people don't think about uh, often enough, is the power of that backlist. Uh, you know, you've written these books. 
And, um, you know, we get so caught up in this book release schedule and the, the new thing is the hot thing and it's going to do, you know, we want to watch it run up the charts and, and all of this good stuff. And then we're on to the next project. And then we put those same expectations on the new project when, uh, most writers, if you just keep your head down and keep working, um, you accumulate this thing that can work for you forever, you know, this backlist and, um, the there's real power in having work that you've already completed and accomplished and letting that, uh, you know, finding new markets for it or, uh, you know, whatever you're doing, but having, having those things out there are, uh, are tremendous for an author's long-term career. Oh, it's wonderful. It's really, really wonderful. And I've got a really great team, um, you know, in New York and it's, you know, so every time they do really well with something, then we, um, it just gives people a chance to kind of discover other stuff, which otherwise, uh, with when we wrote when Lovely's Chocolate Shop in Paris came out, and it didn't do brilliantly well. And I said to my publisher in London, and I, I said, oh, I'm, I'm really disappointed. And she said, Well, people like to dream about maybe moving to Scotland and moving to the country. She said, Paris is a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> Most people would like to visit Paris, but the idea of living there is quite frightening. Um, and I, I, I could see what she meant, but, of, you know, and I could understand that if I was kind of selling, if you like, a, a, a fantasy or maybe something that you might do in your life, this wasn't something that, that loads of people wanted to do. But I, I always felt sad for the book, which I think is, I'm, I'm really, really fond of it. So it, uh, it, it's lovely that it's getting a second life. Absolutely. Uh, when you start revisiting uh, things in your back catalog, are you ever tempted to uh, to want to go and, and change a story or, oh, I wish I would have done that? Uh, or are you one of those people that can just say it, it is what it is and I'm off you know, to other stories now? Oh, there's nothing. That's why I don't read critics or, or Amazon reviews or Goodreads or anything like that. Once the book is out there, there is literally nothing nothing you can do about it so there is absolutely no point the only thing I do occasionally because I've been a writer for a long time like 20 years there's certain phrases uh, or, or descriptions that we might have used 20 years ago that we wouldn't use now so uh, you know if ever we find one of the one of those um, then we take it out um, you know just to keep changing terms and, and so on but apart from that um, no 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 I wouldn't I don't I, I wouldn't go back and read my old stuff or look at my old stuff well, the new book that's out now, Christmas at Rosie Hopkins Sweet Shop, uh, what a fun novel. Um, the, these characters actually showed up uh, in a in a previous book. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, welcome to Rosie Hopkins Sweet Shop of Dreams. I'm not crazy about that title. I can only tell you that long titles were very fashionable when that book came out first. <laughs> um, but it is, it's a very sweet story. Again, it's about a nurse um, who moves to help her old grandmother and there's a relationship between the older women and the younger women that I'm very fond of yeah in fact yes we can tell it goes back a bit because the main the the older women character is um was a young girl during the war which is kind of increasingly rare these days right right sure is um Jenny, I, I love the book. I love everything that you do. Um, you're, you're so fun to talk to. Um, if people are just discovering you and all that you do, where can they connect with you online? Oh, uh, Instagram. I am Jenny Colvin Books. She said slightly, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> but if you want to talk to me, I'm on Twitter as at Jenny Colgan. And I'm that writer, Jenny Colgan, on Facebook. So easy to find. Great. Good We're going to... I'll link all of those uh, in the show notes of this episode, as well as the new book, Christmas at Rosie Hopkins Sweet Shop. Uh, Ginny, thank you so much for coming back on the show oh, with me thanks. today. It's been lovely. Thank you. And it's pitch dark outside, I can tell you, on a very frosty night in Scotland. Oh, that, that just sets the, uh, sets the tone. We'll get a cup of coffee and pick up the new book. <laughs> now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Mather steepled his hands. You asked to join us once? Hedwick leaned forward, eagerly. The appointed. Does that appeal? Yes. Do you even know what we do? My grandmother used to say that you control the world. That's not far off. But why? To what end? I don't know. 
Power? Pour me a bourbon. Mather reached into his briefcase and produced a file folder. I want to tell you one story. Have you ever heard of Centralia, Pennsylvania? No. He produced a photo for Hedwig's inspection. Spring of 1962. A pretty little town, wasn't it? Whitewash and ticky-tacky, pastel housewives and perfect lawns. A mining community, mostly. Coal. He turned over a second photo. A lovely young woman. There was a single witch in Centralia named Anna Lively. Anna had a green thumb. She could make her garden grow, whisper to a flower, and send it shooting from the ground like that. Just lovely. But she was discovered. That spring, a boy named Bobby Avery received a Bell and Howell Zoomatic movie camera for his 11th birthday. Bobby amused himself by filming his neighbors, sometimes without their knowledge, through windows and over garden fences. Twelve seconds of film. Just a girl and her garden patch and one swiftly blooming rose. It killed the town. Bobby showed it to his friends. Children believe readily. Bobby was the first to die. Parents looked into it, watched the film themselves, and they began to die. Anna disappeared. Perhaps they attacked her. Perhaps she escaped. But even in her absence, knowledge of a true witch was running wild through the population, as if Anna had beckoned it herself to grow verdant and spread. The Great Curse had killed 64 Centralians by the 1st of June. The footage was offered to a national news organization. That was the precipice. It might have been shown in prime time, between Leave It to Beaver and My Three Sons. We came very close to another worldwide calamity, but we were fortunate. One of our own was in place at the network. He alerted his superiors, and they ended the situation. Do you know how? I'm afraid to ask. Mather laid down another photo. This is Centralia today. It was an aerial view of a forest. Endless trees and underbrush cut through by lanes of pavement. Just a maze of cracking asphalt, like the foundations of Sodom, ripped bare by the wrath of God. Only a cemetery remained, on a hill overlooking the former town. A white marble angel stood among the graves, grieving for the ruins below, like Lot's wife, turned to salt. You destroyed the whole town? Not I. This was well before my time. But, yes. Just as you'd cauterize a wound to stop a patient from bleeding to death. We blamed it on an uncontrollable mine fire, deep below the earth. We actually set the coal burning, in case someone investigated. It burns today. Touch any of those streets and you'll find them hot. The asphalt melting, as if the town sat just above perdition. It's not something we're proud of, but it was necessary. To save the world. Centralia, Pennsylvania, and everyone who'd seen that film, had to be sacrificed. Mather collected the photos. So, that is why the appointed exist, and that is what we do. Still want to join 